It is once again that time. Time to begin another tourist cycle. And if you're asking the question of yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I going through the tourist cycle another time? That's probably because you've only done it once or twice and not 20 times. Because after you've done this a number of times, you figure out uh, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons. Because there is new revelation every single year. Pray you guys had a great time at Sukkot, whatever you did. I ended up in Florida uh, with some wonderful folks down there and uh, had just a, actually just a, one day to spend. But uh, it, was, it was a very good time to begin with for anyone that is uh, tuning in now that I've just met. Uh, welcome to this program. And I uh, hope you enjoy this one and all the other programming that we do with the, uh, the Israel Update, Foundations for Life, and also Life on Purpose podcast, which uh, is, is gaining some steam. It's, uh, I'm getting some really great response from that one. So uh, speaking of Israel Update, in just a few days, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, I'll be uh, heading to Israel. We have 23 of us going on a tour. Uh, the vast majority of people are either going in early, staying late, or both. And so uh, I think that my when we have people depart for the uh, for the air for the airport for Ben Gurion, that there's just going to be like five people on the bus. I don't know. But uh, so if you would like to give, we are taking, of course, donations to Israel as I do every time that I go. And uh, this year, no exception. Uh, we have had some a great response once again, and so if you would like to to give, you can still. There's time. You can send a check to Joy to Hashem. Uh, go to joyhashem.org. Get our address there, or you can uh, give via, via PayPal or a um, uh, credit card on there. Whatever you'd like to do, you can even call our office. We'd be glad to take your information. But uh, every uh, all money that comes in that's marked Israel goes to Israel in some way or another. So if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, please uh, please just send that if you would. So uh, let's get into Bereshit, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, Bereshit Elohim bara et hashemaim et haretz. Et haretz, bad Hebrew. But uh, I want to bring out something about this uh, this word Elohim here. It does not say Yud Hey Vav Hey. So for those that you know are, are just focusing in on that one name, uh, he doesn't use just one name because he his name isn't really a name. It's more of a revelation to us. So it says that Elohim. Uh, this is a, a word that's plural, by the way. Not that we serve multiple gods. Uh, we serve one Elo, uh, Elohim, one God, but he is revealed to us in many ways. But this, this word Elohim, I just want to go through it a little bit here. Uh, first of all, again, it is plural, so it can mean judges or holy ones. Uh, this could be the, uh, a court of the heavens, okay? But then if we go to the root of Elohim, it is the word God, and if we go to the root of the word God, and we're taking this word, you know, back, and as Brad Scott would say, going back up to the, uh, to the top of the mountain with it, we're going to the root of the root of the root. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, go over and read for you where this, one of the places that this word, which is uh, uh, Aleph, um, I, I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. So you can go in and look at it. You just go to Blue Letter Bible. I mean, you can do the same thing that I do. Uh, it takes a little while to just get used to it. But if you go to uh, Blue Letter Bible, type in Genesis 1-1, and it's going to bring up Elohim. You're going to go to Elo, and then you're going to go to the root, to the root, to the root of this thing. And you're going to find that the one of the uh, first times that this word, that is the root that we go to Elohim with is found in Bereshit chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, uh, in verse 13, and it says, Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram. That's the word, ram. So the root of the word Elohim is ram, caught in the bushes by its horns, 
Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering. Hmm. So that, that should be making you go, hmm. So within the confines of the Elohim that is creating the heavens and the earth is one who is likened to the ram. So if, if we take it from there and consider that, uh, I'm going to go all the way over to Colossians. And uh, Colossians gives us, uh, this is one of those uh one of those places you probably don't go to often, but I love, I, I love this. Uh, there's so much in this, um, this book. I was, I was uh, with someone this past week that um, was teaching, and it wasn't really a part of the, the Sukkot that I was in, but they were teaching that uh, the writings of Shaul, that Shaul Paul is a false prophet, and I, it just grieved me. Uh, not because I, I believe they're wrong, though I do believe they're wrong, but they're missing so much of the truth of Scripture as Paul kind of gives us some, uh, some, some filling in the blanks, if you would. And in Colossians, I want to start reading in verse 14. It is through his Son that we have redemption. That is, our sins have been forgiven. He is the visible image of the invisible Elohim, he is supreme over all creation, because in connection with him were created all things, in heaven, Hashemaim, and on the earth, Haaretz, visible and invis and, and visible and invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, or authorities, going back to that word Elohim, they have all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things, and he holds everything together. Okay, so if you're ever wondering uh, what's going on in the world, that, that last part, he holds everything together. So I'm not going to go into, um, into all of this. I, I just, you know, if you want to rewind that now and kind of go back through it a little bit and consider that in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And there is a part of Elohim that is likened to the ram who is going to be the substitutionary for the fall of man. So before everything began, if you're wondering, you know, if Genesis uh, 3 is like, oh no, what has happened? I created all of this and it's falling apart right before my eyes. No. He had in place redemption. He had in place redemption. And that is why I put in the, uh, in, in the, the white above the word Bereshit in, my, in the complete Jewish Bible, the word Genesis. I've written this, and I begin every single Torah cycle with these words. Before I read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, I read these words. The Torah points us to the Redeemer, while in itself offering no redemption. Where do I get that? In Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, Behold, I am coming. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. And so, why is it that we're crazy enough to go through the Torah portion every single year, year after year after year? Because I believe that there is a revelation of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, within these pages of Genesis to Deuteronomy that I have not seen yet. It's like a, uh, liken it to an anniversary. Uh, if you've been married a while, every single year should be another revelation of something about your spouse that you didn't know. So every Torah cycle is to be a revelation of the Almighty, of His redemption, of His plan for our lives. But as I read in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Every year I go back to the question, why? Uh, 
if I ever ask the question like I did last year, why, uh, give it another year and you go, why? And, and then you give it another year and go, why? And it just, that, that word just kind of, as you see the things that are happening around us, why in the world? Why the world? You know, if he, as I believe the word says, declared the end out of the beginning, knowing all things, uh, it, do, do you, or are you, when you look at the, the news today, is there a grieving inside of you? When you see the, the agendas of, of people regarding our, our children, regarding, uh, re regarding God, it's like, I look at the news and it's, I, I just don't want to look at it anymore. Him knowing the end out of the beginning, the answer is why? Well, I believe that that, uh, that, that answer is found in Revelation chapter 21, the first few verses. I'll uh, just challenge you to go to those verses yourself and understand that that is actually the beginning. And Genesis chapter 1 is the start of everything that takes him to the beginning, which is those words of Revelation chapter 21, the first few verses. So he saw, i just let you in on this, he, he saw a people in his mind, in his dreams, his dream, his vision, is that he saw a people that would he would be their God, that they would be his people. And seeing all that would take to get from that point to that point, he did it anyway. Now, sometimes I, I question, uh, was it worth it? And I guess that since he has already seen the end out of the beginning, that he says it is. And so this is where we need to come back to the place of asking the question again, but more on a personal level. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Why? So that we could have a place of influence. It, it says the heavens, Hashemayim, a plural, and the earth, a singular. So we see in the writings, once again, of Shaul, he said, I was taken to the third heavens. I've taught on that before. And so the heavenly realm, we could say it more like this, that the heavenly realms would be, the, the earth would be influenced by those realms. The earth would become a mirror image. Just as you go out to a horizon, uh, a horizon uh, at, the, at, the, at an ocean, and you look out toward the horizon. There, on a clear, calm day, you really can't see where one ends and the other one begins. Where is that line? I've I mean, living on the the ocean, various places, and uh, it, being in uh, places that that it, you see the horizon. There's nothing between you and it, and, and you're standing there, and you're like. Okay, I, I think I understand, I, I think I know just because, just because I, I got the kind of the math, the image in my head, but I, I'm not really sure, pinpoint, where one ends and the other one begins. And that's the image that we have of our influence in this earth. That our life should be it lived in such a way that when people look at us, they can't quite figure it out of which realm we're actually living in because our job is to bring forth that heavenly realm into this earthly realm. We are to blur the line, if you would. So he goes on, and I'm not going to get into the, the days of creation, except to say this. It is written. What is written is written. Um, I'm a very firm believer that if you cannot believe Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 
you will never believe Revelation 22. That if the enemy can put doubt in your mind, well, a day is not a day, and a, a dog is not a dog, and a horse is not a horse, and a tree is not a tree, and a garden is not a garden, but these are just euphemism and, and allegories and, and, and pictures and things like this of what he's really saying. No, I, I, I just go back to a garden's a garden, and a tree is a tree, and a dog is a dog. You know, it's worked out pretty well for me that this is a, an account that the Father has given to us of what happened. And the first test of faith is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I just was able to meet uh, Kent, uh, Kent Hovind, uh, Dr. Dino. I had followed his teachings uh, through a, a lot of years, uh, difficult years for him as some things happen in his life. We'll go into that. But uh, I've, I, I've studied in, in the early years of my uh, coming to Messiah, I studied Institute for Creation Research. I, I met Dr. Ken Ham, Dr. Henry Morris, had had such an influence in my life. Uh, Dr. Dino, and you can go is I think drdino.com, I think it is, but uh, creation science, and and I guess where I've never had the it just has not caused problems because when I saw creation science, it was like that makes sense. I don't have to go to man's so-called science and put the scripture through man's science. I mean, how many of us today are finding out that what was called conspiracies just a few years ago, uh, just a few months ago, was man's science that was really not true? And so I don't have a problem. And I don't need to complicate it with anything. So I just believe, and you can call me simple, you can call me whatever you want, but I believe in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and that day one was day one, and day two was day two, and a garden was a garden, and a tree was a tree, and a dog was a dog. And I'm not changing, okay? So that's just the way I am. He says to these people to Adam and to Eve, Adam is, is, Eve is still in Adam at the time, but he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and every living creature that crawls on the earth. The, the, the wording here is be fruitful. Okay. That's just, that's what it means. Be fruitful. So it's, it's like a tree is commanded to bear fruit. If it's a fruit tree, it is supposed to bear fruit. So we are to do that. But what is the, I've told this many years ago, what is the purpose of fruit? And what, is the, what is the purpose of fruit? The purpose of fruit is not for your pleasure. It's not for your nourishment. It's not for the beauty of a piece of fruit. A piece of fruit is for a seed. So a tree brings forth a piece of fruit, so there is a seed, so there can be another tree, so there can be more fruit, so there can be more seed. So an apple orchard begins as a seed, and that seed becomes a tree that bears fruit and eventually becomes an orchard. So we are to be that same way in our lives. Am I saying physically or spiritually? And the answer is yes. Okay, We are to become great. The word here, multiply, is to become abundant. It is tied to the word of greatness. And, and people have a problem with us. That uh, somehow, you know, in life, that you're to be this, this humble, meek, little, insignificant thing upon the earth. No, no. You were called, you were created for greatness. You were called and created for, or created and called for influence. I, I thought about this morning. Uh, I met many people that believe that they're an introvert. Uh, I don't believe that there are introverts. I believe that everybody is an extrovert. 
but an introvert is an extrovert that hasn't really found their purpose. But think about that. When you find your purpose, it doesn't matter how shy you are. You're going to become an extrovert. Okay? I know that. I was like the shyest child ever to live on planet Earth for the first uh, 10 or 12 years or so of my life. Okay? But then when I found my purpose, the introvert, the shy kid, became the one that talks all the time. Why? Because I know what's inside of me. So you're not an introvert. You're not shy. You just haven't really come to the realization of what the Father's put inside of you. When you do that, life is going to change. And you're going to become great in your influence. And the word here is, and subdue it, is actually to accomplish the purpose by filling. If you see a glass that is empty, it doesn't, what, what purpose does it have? It has purpose, but it's not fulfilling its purpose, is it? You know, you can take an empty glass and it's not going to quench your thirst no matter how many times you put it up to your mouth because it doesn't have, it's not fulfilling its purpose. So when you place water in the glass, it now has reached its place of purpose. It became filled up so that it could then give unto others. So we are to be fruitful, which is about seed becoming seed. We are to become great in our influence. And we are to allow our lives to be filled so that we can fill other people's lives. And then the, uh, the word rule over the fish of the sea is to make subservient. Uh, you can go to Romans and you can read where man is, is at right now. Worshipping the, uh, the creation instead of the creator. I, I saw this silliness the other day in Europe. Uh, a bunch of, uh, of misle misled uh, young people are pouring out milk on the floor of, uh, of, of grocery stores. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you think, and I just met with uh, a cousin I haven't seen in 50-something years uh, down in Florida, and he was telling me how the government is talking to them about taxing. Uh, he says, you know, we're having a hard time holding on to our farm to begin with, and the government is talking about taxing them for the belching of the cows. Really? He's telling me that, they were, that some of the uh, agriculture department is wanting them to give the cows uh, some kind of, of medication or something so they won't belch as much. Guys, you know, a cow was made to belch, okay? It's just part of their... Their, their digestive system, it just does that. And if you think the cow's belching is causing some kind of change in the climate of this world, I, I, I'm sure that nobody here, nobody's listening to me, believes that. But if you happen to know somebody that believes that, I don't know what to say to them. I, I really have no words that, that these people, they're just misled. Not understanding the purpose, not understanding that we are sub to subdue, we are to take authority, but see this word dominion, take authority, dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature that crawls on the earth. Ah, well, the dominion, though, doesn't begin with the fish, you know, the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. It begins with taking dominion over ourselves. It begins with taking dominion over ourselves. And in order to do that, we need to understand who we are. So down in uh, chapter 2, verse 7, I know there's six chapters. I, I just like, I, I feel like I'm, you know, it's like speed teaching here. I, I could spend probably a whole, a whole Torah cycle just on these six chapters. Uh, these six chapters in verse 7 of chapter 2 then Adonai Elohim formed a person an Adam 
from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life so that he became a living creature, a living being. Out of Nihel, he planted a garden toward the east of Eden, and it goes on from there. So, he breathed. He breathed into Adam. So he takes this piece of dirt. I personally go along with the rabbinic tradition that, uh, and it, you know, we can't call it science because nobody was there except God, but I personally believe he took it from the Temple Mount, what is now the Harabite, the Temple Mount. He, he, play, he makes this, this dirt man, this kind of Gumby thing out of, uh, out of Play-Doh, you know. It's clay, so he makes this. And it's just there. It's like this clay image. Then he breathes into it. And it is his breath that animates this man, Adam, so that he can do what is listed in chapter 1, verse 28. It is the breath of the Almighty that causes, that empowers, let's say it that way, the breath of the Almighty empowers the lump of clay to do his job of being fruitful, multiplying, filling, and also subduing. And this is why man is confused today. Because man has separated himself from the breath of life. Uh, it's very simple. When he spoke, when he desired fish, he spoke to the sea. When he wanted trees, he spoke to the ground. When he wanted a man, he spoke out of himself. So if you take a fish out of the water, it dies. If you take a tree out of the ground, it dies. If you take the breath of Elohim out of the man, what do we do? We disconnect. And we begin the process of dying, which is what is written to us in the instructions of the two trees. You are to eat of this tree and not of that tree. The, the beginning of confusion is this, that Adam and Eve, specifically Eve, desires to change the definitions of words. We could say it like this, Adam, that tree, the tree of life, is food. That tree, the tree of the knowledge of evil, is not food. Now, both of them can be consumed, but one is to be considered food, the other is not food. The same as you can go out into a field, there's a cow, there's a pig. Both can be consumed. But only one can be called food from the scripture. So is the, uh, are the kosher dietary laws, uh, are, they, uh, are they important? Well, if it had been a little bit more important to, to Eve and, and then to Adam, well, we might have a little difference here, you know, in life today. We'd still be in the garden instead of singing the song, we got to get back to the garden. The whole thing unravels with, the, with chapter 3, uh, the serpent. And I, and I believe that this is, uh, this word I understand is this, this shiny thing. It's not a, it's not a snake, okay? It's, it's still, it has feet, it has legs. Uh, we don't really understand, but it's something shiny, something that is brilliant, something that is attracting Eve to it. There's all kinds of places I can go here. But she is attracted to this shiny thing. My question is, where's Adam? It, it appears in the wording. I think you can make a, a pretty good... Um, uh, argument for this that Adam is somewhere watching the whole thing happen but he's I, I don't want to get involved I'm just going to let my wife make her own decisions talk to whoever she wants to talk to 
be a part of whatever she wants to be. She needs to make her decisions for her own life. No, Adam, you are put in charge of the garden. There is an authority that you are to uphold in the garden. And the first thing that he fails to do is to protect his garden. The question is not uh, so much regarding what's going on with the serpent, but here's what needs to be asked. Why is the serpent there? Why, did, why is Adam allowing the serpent in the garden? Why is, the, why is Adam allowing the serpent to talk to his wife? Uh, that's the real problem. That Adam wasn't taking care of his garden. And because of that, he allowed a serpent to speak to his wife. And she started to, he, she began to question. It was, did Yah really say? Did, did God really say that you were not to, to eat of the tree? Oh, oh we're, we're not to eat of or touch it. Did God really say? No, go back and read what it actually says in chapter 2, verse 13. It says, um, excuse me, it's not... Um, Okay, in, in 15, Adonai Elohim took the person, put him in the garden to cultivate it. It goes on and says, You may freely eat from every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You are not to eat from it, because on the day that you eat from it, it will become certain that you will begin a dying process. That's the, my understanding of the words here. That in dying you shall die. You will be disconnected from the breath, though you will still be breathing the air, you will be disconnected from the breath that has given you life. And that is the death that is going to come. So, did God really say is the words that are given to Eve, uh, understanding that when Eve ate of the fruit, she was deceived by the serpent. But if we go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we will find out that Adam, in taking the fruit, was not deceived. He knew full well what was going on. And this is the first instance of idolatry in the scripture. This is the uh, you are to have no other gods before me. When looking at the piece of fruit, whatever it might be, looking at his wife and considering his God, he chose his wife over his God. I would have to expound on that by saying that the reason that he had to make that choice in the first place is because he failed in his first ministry to his wife. He failed in the order in the garden. If he was ministering properly to his wife, he would have never allowed the serpent into the garden because he knew that the serpent would cause his wife to... Uh, to doubt, uh, he, he should have understood the, the whole, the, this whole thing that ha was going to happen. So it was, and I know that I'm maybe sounding a little judgmental here, but it was spiritual laziness. When we become spiritually lazy, we allow the enemy a foothold into our lives. It will cause us to have to make decisions that we never really should have had to make in the first place. Now, this says that uh, in the time that you eat of this tree, in dying you shall die. Uh, we can go into, I believe, the writings of Shoal once again, which state that uh, death came through Adam. You know, back to Bereshit chapter 1, verse 1, 
um, in chapter 1, verse 2, there is this response to man's science that happened. This actually goes back to the monkey trials re, uh, revolving around Darwin. That in order to uh, for the the for Christianity of that day, and and this is rampant through uh, uh, Judaism also, that there was a gap between chapter one verse one and verse two, uh, and that the then you it starts to fall apart in that the days weren't really days but were thousands of years. No, it's uh, millions of years. No, it's now billions of years. And you go down this trail and ends up making a monkey or a man uh, out of a monkey. And so I don't go there. Simply put, there could have not have been death upon this earth. Period. Uh, the argument is made that the, the, there was death. And then there was a restoring of in chapter 1, verse 2. And so it all kind of became new again. So it wasn't, death wasn't really there. No, the scripture says that death came through Adam, period. So if there was death prior to the fall of Adam, the disobedience of Adam, if there was death prior to that event, then this book is totally irrelevant and is a lie. Yeah, I said it that plain. There could not have been death upon this earth. Why do, why do people have to go there? Well, dinosaurs and all these kind of things. No, it can all be explained very simply uh, through the flood, through things that happened at Mount St. Helen. Uh, go look at the creation science. The best gift I believe that you can give to your children is a firm understanding of creation science. The best gift that you can give to your grandchildren and generations to come is a good understanding of creation science because with that understanding, they will then have the ability to go back and never ask, well, and never believe the lie that they're going to be told through life, did God really say. Now, death came. Uh, they find fig leaves, and it's interesting that it says fig leaves. You know, you can't cover. Uh, a fig leaf's a pretty big leaf, but you know, when you're trying to, you know, make clothing out of it, uh, they become pretty small. And so these leaves, uh, I, I just kind of had a thought about it this morning, Ah, here's another reason to go to the Torah portion every year, the Torah cycle. Uh, it, it was leaves plural. There was so many things that were involved in that fall. It wasn't just about the disobedience, but it was the leaf of guilt, the, life, the leaf of shame, the leaf of humiliation. These were all the things that were going on in the spirit of Adam and Eve. And they were trying to cover themselves with those things. But we understand that um, leaves, fig leaves are a picture to us here of us trying to do things that will somehow weigh out the balances in the end. Well, I, I did this, so I'm going to do this. Uh, you know, I, I, I stole a, you know, I stole a candy bar when I was, when I was a child. So I'm going to give, you know, a hundred dollars to a charity and that's going to kind of balance out. Uh, no, that's not how the scripture works, folks. Uh, sin is sin and there's no fig leaf that can cover that up. There's no amount of mitzvot, uh, righteous deeds that can be done in order to cover those things up. It's in the end, simply fig leaves that, um, that wither, that dry and go away. There's nothing we can do. So in the midst of this, 
we see chapter 3, verse 15. If there's a verse in Scripture that, um, that you, should, you should know what the verse is. When somebody says Genesis 3.15, you should know it. Uh, you should be able to quote it, actually. And it says in 15, I will put animosity between you and the woman, between your descendant and her descendant. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. That verse is the beginning of the revelation of the gospel. Now, understanding that the if we go to the book of Revelation, it is said to us that Messiah was slain before the foundations of the earth. How is that? Because he declared the end out of the beginning. There's never been a day that he... Uh, you know, the sun came up and he said, wow, I, I wasn't seeing this. I, I just didn't see that. I, I, I didn't figure this into the equation. It's kind of a funny statement to me that have you, has it ever occurred to you that no, nothing's ever occurred to God? That everything is present with him. That everything is the reality of the present. I, I have different ways of don't have time to do it to explain that. But basically it's this. That before Bereshit chapter 1 verse 1 was the first verses of Revelation chapter 21. And in chapter 21 of Revelation is everything that is needed to take us from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation chapter 21, including the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. So this is the revelation, the beginning of the revelation to Adam, and it is, it is spoken to the serpent, but in the hearing of Adam. And to me, it is basically this. Adam, you listen to the wrong voice. Because you listen to the wrong voice, there are consequences that are going to come into your life, one of them being the process of death. Now, guys, listen to this. Death is a gift. Death is the most remarkable gift that the Father has given to us. Outside of the life, the restored life, death of the physical being is a great gift. If the Almighty had allowed Adam and Eve to go to continue in the garden, and they would have eaten of the tree of life, they would have been stuck in their process of death. So death of our physical being is a gift in order that our physical being can be restored back to prior to the fall. I hope you kind of maybe you got to think about that one a little bit later on. So this is the beginning which takes me back to my opening statement here of Scripture, the Torah points us to the Redeemer while in itself offering no redemption. Everything from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 to Revelation chapter 21 is the unveiling of the revelation of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Everything. Whether it be Adam, or whether it be Avraham coming forth from Avram, we see it in Isaac and the ram, we see it, you know, entering in the promised land, everything that's happening between this point and Revelation chapter 21 is an unveiling of the revelation.
we see chapter 4 is a path. Adam now becomes fruitful. Becomes, becomes fruitful in his present state of death. So, up until this point, we see that Adam was created in the image of Elohim, but his children are created in the image of Adam. So they have within them that choice and that flaw toward the choice, which that was that's the, the words of, uh, of Romans, when we go through Romans, we talk and it, and it says it talks about death and how we are all have entered into the curse of Adam. I'm not going to go into all those verses, but this is a path toward the beginning, and then we see this. I mean, so much is happening in these these thousand years between Adam and Noah. But what's happened? Can we see something? And I know that most of you understand this, but in chapter 5, we see the genealogy. And and how many of us go through? They're kind of glassy-eyed. You know, I can't, a lot of the names, I can't even pronounce them, you know. But these names, just as it was for the tribes last week in Devarim, these names give us a message. So nothing is in Scripture of its own. And I'm just going to go through quickly. In chapter 5, if we take the names, put them together, this is the sentence that comes forth out of it. Man is appointed to mortal sorrow, but the blessed Elohim shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Notice it says, Elohim shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort. That's in, the, that's in the words of chapter 5. Now, i got to go to chapter, 20, t- chapter 6 because I'm almost out of time here. And we see the, the, the sons of man. I, folks, it, talking about the Nephilim, all these things. To me, the teachings today of the Nephilim are a, I don't want to say a waste of time, but they're a distraction. They're a distraction. Uh, in conversation with Brad Scott years ago, um, I, I truly believe that this was not a physical intercourse, but was a spiritual intercourse. It was the modification of DNA that was being done in the days prior to Noah, the same thing that is being done today. But I, I, I have to ask this question in closing. If you become fearful of those things, what are you more fearful of? I, I, my place is fearing God more than that. Okay? The Nephilim, no matter who they are, what they are, they were still created beings. I do not serve a created being. I serve one that is the one that put it all into place. He spoke, and the worlds came into exist. The world came into existence. Be careful what you're afraid of in these days. <sighs> we made it through there somehow. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, Haksameach. Bezrat Hashem, see you again next week. Haksameach, because I guess we just went through it, so that was kind of irrelevant. So, uh, Shavuot Tov, have a blessed, prosperous week. Guys, I'm already, my brain is already, I got papers all over my desk uh, regarding Israel and the tour. So, it's amazing that I can focus a little bit for 50 minutes to, uh, to get these teachings done. Bezrat Hashem, see you again next week. And until then, be strong. Yivarechach Adonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai panav elecha V'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Panave <laughs>
Shalom.